Today, rather than going into any specific facts per se, I wanted to, to give us more of a, an overview of the coast and, and the kind of issues we're going to be talking about and how these things play in with one another. But before we do that, I want to start with what the beach out at uh, Summerlin looked like almost exactly a year ago today. We'd had the refugio oil spill, which was in the early part of that summer. And uh, we'll be talking about that later on, uh, not today. But suffice it to say, there's a bunch of oil floating around, and then the oil mostly got cleaned up. And then, just as classes were starting, I got this phone call, and these guys said, can you please come up and look at this beach off of Summerland in Santa Barbara County, because there's more, more oil here now. And it turns out what was going on here seems to be a poorly... Um, it, it's both a mix of seep oil as well as a poorly capped oil uh, well. So we've been manipulating the coastal zone for a long time. This is not, uh, we'll learn in this class that a big change happened around World War II. But even before World War II, we've been, we've been interacting and changing and perturbing these systems for, for centuries and millennia. So in this case, this was, this was at least partly resulting from some of our previous activities that we hadn't really properly accounted for. And on this beach, it's just sort of a nice looking around to see just a, a subset of the challenges that we face. So if, I did, if you guys just stare at this, just stare at this beach, do you see any, um, what kind of marine or coastal management challenges might you, uh, might you pick up from there? Just look at that picture. Yeah. Horses. How do you know there are horses there? There you go. Horse, horse prints. There you go. So the horse, people are walking their horses up and down the beach. Oh, and also you guys, for the first week or two, do me a favor, say your name because I'm still trying to learn everybody's name. But um, yeah, okay, so horses, good. So we have, so that, that's a unique, uh, maybe not wholly unique, but that's an important stressor. What else? It's, uh, coastal development up against the bluff. Good. So there's all these, there's all these uh, p people up here, houses up here, and then maybe a little hard to tell in this darkness, but um, all this non-native vegetation that's been planted, a mix of native but also non-native vegetation that's been planted and watered. So, uh, you know, fresh water sources coming onto the beach. Good, what else? Some dog poop. Yeah, okay, so, right, so, so animal waste, right? So there's, there's, uh, there's horse waste as well as dog waste, good. Offshore drilling, right? So we have some we have some uh, oil here on the beach. Um, unclear at this point, just from this picture, where it came from. But clearly, um, there are in this case there's natural seeps. So some of this was always happening here before humans started doing anything. Chumash are one of the only uh, native peoples in the world to make the type of canoes they make, which are totally insane. Nobody else made these canoes. They made plank canoes. Everybody else carved out a log, right? Or took animal skin and stretched it. These guys just took pieces of wood and slapped them together, basically. And they could do that because they had the luxury of all this asphalt, all this tar floating around. So they could take that tar, jam it into the holes in between those planks, and make it watertight. So, so they didn't have to go chop down a big giant mahogany tree or some giant cypress tree to make their ocean-going vessel. They could just use you know, smaller pieces of wood. So, so they're absolutely, um, oil is part of the picture here in the coastal zone. What else? So there's that oiling we talked about. And what we're looking at right here, that, that's, that's the different, uh, the tide has been going down. And the, because the oil floats on water, as it's, as it's, you know, it's kind of float, floating, foaming, and the wave kind of rushes up, dumps it, and then goes down. And so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the receding, receded, a d deposit line of oily froth in this in these sort of uh, chocolate bands here on the on the coast and then you guys right you talked about um, the animal waste so we had it could be just physically trampling and you know critters could be stepping on stuff they could be eating things or 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 changing the behavior of birds seabirds stuff like that and they could just be bringing in waste and that waste could just be waste um, but it could also bring in maybe seeds of of plants from elsewhere that maybe are not native to our area and then there's this whole idea of, if we look at this, um, we don't see much rack here. So this is a huge problem in a lot of our coastal zones. So rack, rack spelled with a W, 
meaning the no longer attached uh, organic material. So the pieces of a seagrass, the pieces of a uh, algal, of a, of a kelp plant, that kind of stuff. So they might not technically be dead yet, but they're on their way to being dead because they're no longer attached and they're starting to float around. So rack is this sort of floating biological stuff. And, uh, and we generally don't like that. We like very clean beaches here in Southern California. So we remove that aspect of our sandy beach, which radically changes the ecology because lots of critters like that rack. Lots of critters need that rack. So when we clean the beach to make it look pretty for us, we're changing the, the community that can live there. And then we have, in this case, is some kid built a sand castle. So you know, we're, we're constantly manipulating sand all the time. Is anyone taking Dr. Patch's uh, physical oceanography class? No? Okay, cool. So that's, so that's our first time we're offering that class. So, so that speaks to more of the physical manipulation of sand and things like that. And as you guys mentioned, we have a lot of people there. So there's people up on the coast, but then also um, when the people go there, then we have to start doing the other things. And so in this case, one of the other things is starting to put structures that will keep the waves from eroding the cliffs. So in this case, there are boulders there um, to harden and make the the coastline uh, harder to manipulate. The reality is there's all these stressors together, right? All these things are happening simultaneously. In some places, some systems, we can very clearly see one particular driver or one particular stressor, and then everything else is, sub is, is secondary or subordinate. In the coastal zone, it's usually one thing on top of another, on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. So it, it, not only do we have the challenge of that that first challenge, that first stressor, stressor, we have the compounding mixing of all this stuff together. Um, and it never seems to end. So uh, some of you guys here were helping us with our uh, annual uh, Sandy Beach monitoring. I hope you, more of you guys are interested in helping us this year with that. Um, we I just sent everybody home. We just finished up and literally everybody was gone. Emily was going to see her relatives uh, in Hawaii and uh, other people had doctor's appointments. I woke up, this is in late June, woke up and my wife was at a conference and my son and I were like, hey, we're sleeping in summer, finally summer. And uh, the radio said, uh, oil spill. I was like, what? They're talking about the refugio spill from last year? And it's oil spill, heading to the beach. I'm like, what? Where's that? Ventura. Ventura, what? So I go yell at my son, Gabriel, get up, we're going. He's, like, uh, you know, he's 13, so he's like half asleep. Uh, I'm like, we're going to the beach now. And he says, uh, Wait, what? It's like, come on, we gotta go. There's nobody help, we gotta go. So we go run down, we stop here at school, grab all our stuff, run down to Ventura, downtown Ventura. And as we're just about to get there, it, it, in listening to the news, it's like, well, it's not to the beach yet. Okay, phew, good. We can sample the beach before it hits. Oh man. And then it was, well, not sure it's really gonna even get to town. And what? So we drive up, so we start driving through where they said it was and roll down our windows to see if we could smell the oil, crude oil. Could not smell anything. So we went farther and farther up into the hills, the Ventura Hills, um, uh, to see if we could find what was going on. And we found a, an area where these guys were, were doing some cleanup and we didn't want to mess with them. So we drove around them and we just stumbled into the main spill site. And so there's all these reporters and like one fire truck. And so we walked on in and said, hey, you know, can we help? And so long story short, this is, this is us sampling some of this. So what happened in this case, this was like the refugio thing a year beforehand, this was a pipeline transporting oil from one area to another. In this case, it was going from the fields, oil fields in, in the, the back of our county to um, uh, down towards LA. And uh, now this is all, the court documents are all sealed. So I, I can't blog more about it right now, but, um, Essentially what happened was these guys were doing routine servicing on a valve right above this gentleman's house. So we're in, we're in a barranca right underneath this guy's house, very, very steep ravine. And they were changing out a valve and they heard them and they had a, one of those you know, giant lights that lights up the night and they were sitting there changing this valve up until like 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night, the previous night, right? So it's lit up and they're banging and everything. And boom, 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 done, great. The next morning, these guys hear a, a bang and a hiss, which probably was the pressure valve exploding. And they go back to sleep. And then half hour later, they wake up 
and they have their bedroom window open, they smell the smell of crude. So their house is above this area where, I took, where this picture is taken. Um, and so he goes down and, oh my God, there's oil. So then he goes up, gets on his moped, buzzes around to where the pipeline was, and sure enough, this oil is flowing out of this pipeline. So he calls 911 and tells 911 to get their butts out, the you know, emergency services to get out there. Then he looks and reads off of the sticker on the side of the pipeline, if there's a problem, call this number. So he calls the guys in Long Beach, and this guy says, oh, expletive deleted. Uh, oh my God. So it was clearly a bad uh, valve installation, from my objective opinion, even though the courts are still evaluating, that's pretty much what was going on. In this case, it was great. In this case, this was contained. It was a relatively small amount of oil stopped in a essentially a collection basin before it got into the storm drain and before it went underneath the city and then onto the beach. That's great. But we were lucky that this guy got in his car and went up and called. The refugio spill a year before. Why did that happen? Because a repair dude was fixing the pipe. They didn't even know it had blown. In that case, the control center is in Texas. And so they shut the pipe down and then, the, you know, kind of sort of stopped it. And then the guy was like, okay, you know, pulled up his pants and then, uh, and then called, yep, turn it back on. So then it started flowing again. So, so these coastal systems are very complex. I don't share these examples to say that, you know, these guys are purely evil or something, but it really is complex when you have all this layered infrastructure and everybody living and everybody trying to recreate, it's a real challenge. It's a challenge for the most sophisticated people in the world, let alone folks that are in agencies that are underfunded, understaffed, that kind of stuff. Most recently, we just had the Olympics, right? The Rio Olympics. And we, there's a lot of stories about um, many things, not just Ryan Lochte, but, but about the coastal water quality. So this is not some trumped up photo. This is the coast um, in, in the lead up to uh, the, the goings on down there, right? So as many problems as we have here in our very wealthy country, it's that much harder in a lot of the planet that does not have access to um, the ability to, to deal with stuff that we do. Um, today is the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. Some of you guys have come with us to New Orleans in some of our classes. I hope other of you, others of you come with us uh, this year or in a future year. But um, this is Hurricane Katrina just before it made landfall. This is when it was a Category 5 storm. That was uh, 11 years ago today, right? So another great example of the challenges of being in the coastal zone, not just as the coastal zone is now, but in a warming and changing world, things are gonna get that much crazy, more crazier. And so there's some debate as to whether Hurricane Katrina was a, was a result of climate change. That doesn't matter, actually. The story of Hurricane Katrina is an exact, I would argue, model for what is gonna be happening around the planet. So whether that particular storm in that particular year was spawned or made more worse by climate change. It probably was, but even if it wasn't, that's exactly the scenario. And that was in our big wealthy country with all of our stuff. Imagine when this same storm hits Bangladesh uh, or some other uh, such country. Um, it's, it's very, very challenging. This is Louisiana, this uh, you know, last two weeks. We're going to talk about facts in this class and a lot of challenging management situations. A lot of these things do not have an easy answer, and, and I don't mean to, to say that they do, but we'll be discussing things. But what is absolutely the case is, for example, eight of these congressional representatives that um, are right now asking for money and support for Louisiana, as they should, were folks that did not support relief for Hurricane Sandy when that happened in another part of the country, because that was waste. That was government waste and stuff. But when it happens to them, apparently, it's not waste. The other challenge we have is this storm that just happened was the eighth storm in 13 months that was uh, categorized as what the meteorolog Meteorological and Army Corps people like to call um, a 500-year storm, meaning this storm would happen on average only once every 500 years. We had eight of them 
meaning how much rain was dumped uh, during the storm event. Eight of those happened in the last year plus. One of the stations here in Louisiana two weeks ago got a thousand year storm event amount of water. In 48 hours, they got 32 inches of water. And this is a very flat area. I mean, this, this is you know, flat, 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 flat. Not a lot of mountains, ravines and stuff. There's not just, there's just physically wasn't a place for that, all that water to go. And so that's why we saw the, this unprecedented flooding across Louisiana. This was not, this was a storm that flooded and caused a lot of damage. New Orleans was flooded because of defunct, idiotic, insane, criminal engineering by the Army Corps of Engineers, which is a federal entity that protects you and me. For example, they protect campus here by certifying our levees that we have on our creek. So the same entity is at work around the country. New Orleans was so damaged because the protection system that was supposed to be, that was rated to be able to tolerate this, this is a category five storm I'm showing you here. By the time it got to New Orleans, it was a category one storm in terms of winds. The protection system around New Orleans was supposed to be rated for a category three storm. So this should have been no problem. Instead, 80% of the city flooded. Here we have something different. This was not a, a failure of an, one particular engineering uh, uh, piece. This was rather the whole state going subtitle, basically, or a large part of the state going subtitle. That's the coastal management world we are entering. And these foolish numbers about 500 year storm, 1000 year storm, those are all based on a different world. So those are all based on the probability of what storms were doing in the 1950s and 1960s, etc. We're in a very different time of the planet right now. And uh, th there's, there's all kinds of obvious things like, uh, like physical pollution um, and others. Today, right now, transiting the Arctic is the first ever private cruise ship. People died trying to find this continent, looking for the so-called Northwest Passage. Now climate change is making it a reality. So our world is truly shifting on all these different axes. And so what I want to do next is just, um, it, well, that sounds scary. Sorry, didn't mean to scare everybody. So uh, let's talk about some of the more fun things. So, so the coast is a challenge to manage, but there's also all kinds of really cool dimensions. Casey, do you have a question? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, uh, but the coast has all kinds of interesting stuff. So I want to talk about this story here, which is this artist looking at this uh, beached blue whale in the 1970s. But before we get there, let's talk about a couple of the other cool things about the coast. Um, the coast is really part of our society. It's really all, all across all aspects of us, not just here in Southern California, but around our society. Um, a really healthy coast, a really um, well-managed, um, productive coast is this whole interplay between all these different, um, different factors. One thing we do with coastlines is we, we get um, physical nourishment from them. So in this case, this is a guy in a coastal estuary, uh, a, a duck blind, and he's, he's hunting ducks. He's trying to call some ducks in with, with uh, fake models. And then, and then the live ducks, and he's going to shoot them, and he's going to go eat that, right? So we can get food and sustenance from the coastal zone. Here's another hunter in a, in a similar situation. We can also get wonder from the coastal zone. So this is um, one particular bay in Puerto Rico. Probably shouldn't go there right now because there's a little bit of Zika going on. But, but, um, but bioluminescence, super, super awesome. One of my most favorite things in the world. Uh, I can't wait. Uh, my now that my son's certified, we're going to go check out the sand dollar beds, the bioluminescent and sand dollar beds off of Zuma at night, one of my favorite dives uh, to do. Um, but in this case, this is um, the consequence of single-celled alga floating around in the water and then getting disturbed. And so they're disturbed, and one of the tactics they have is they go, don't eat me! So they scream, don't eat me! But they can't really talk, so they use light. And so they make biological light and they go boo with the idea being that if a guy was about to eat them, and we'll see some videos of this in, in a week or two, if a guy's about to eat them, he's going to squirt out a bunch, the, the guy getting eaten is going to squirt out a bunch of light and go, oh my God, oh my God, this is tasty dude here eating me. 
and then the predators will come eat him is, is, the, is the idea. So, but that also happens if you just bang the water. If, you, if your hand just slaps the water, he doesn't know that you're not a shark about to eat him or a filter feeder about to filter him out of the water. So, so we have all this cool stuff. And, you know, just incredible. When we have a really, really intense algal bloom situation, it is like, it is awesome. And from the, from the sky, from the air, it looks like this. It looks fuzzy and glowy, right? When you're in the water with your mask on, it looks like the Sorcerer's Apprentice. It looks like Mickey Mouse and the Sor Sorcerer's Apprentice. You move your hand through the water, and it's not a glow. It's a thousand little teeny pinpricks of starlight uh, tracing the pattern of your hand through the water. So really, really awesome stuff, incredible stuff. So we can get all kinds of um, amazement from the coastal zone, too. Um, we also have a long history of um, pulling things like energy from the coast. So right here we have some um, examples of some of our historic approaches to, um, to using one of the most consistent resources in the coast zone, and that's wind. So as we'll learn about in the, soon, um, one of the big things, we have land masses, we have the ocean. The ocean doesn't change in temperature very much. The land, terrestrial surface, changes a lot, depending on if it's nighttime, daytime, winter, whatever. And so those differences tend to have air moving around in different ways. And so it's fairly, fairly consistent in certain areas on the coast get pretty consistent winds. So you can, so the Dutch and other folks in Northern Europe figured this out long ago. They can actually use that wind to do things like grind, grind wheat or, or other grains, mill things. And then figured out, oh, we can use it to pump water. And oh, then we can use that to actually generate energy. So um, for Thanksgiving this year, I'm going of all places to Massachusetts. I'm, I'm not a big East Coast guy, but I'm um, gonna go to where these uh, windmill, the, this new wind farm is going uh, off of uh, Cape Cod. And, uh, and that's the new thing is to put in um, non-fossil fuel electric generating turbines in these areas. Sounds great, it is great. Although we do have issues with bird strikes. We have to figure out how to, how to do that in the appropriate way. It's also important to say that the ocean is fundamental to, fundamental to what we consider our lifestyle to be here. I mean, in a lot of places in the world, but especially here in Southern California. Anybody know where this is? Trestles. Yep, trestles. Where's trestles? St. Louis. Right, right. So down, so Southern Orange County, Northern San Diego, that, that region's what we're talking about. And uh, Trestles um, was created. Did you know who created the state park there? Ronald Reagan, when he was governor of California. People don't necessarily think of Ronald Reagan as having a strong environmental uh, legacy. But in this case, um, uh, he set this aside as a state park. And a few years ago, when San Diego was trying to put a, trying to fragment this habitat by putting in a new freeway, the most powerful argument, so Orange County tends to be, tends to vote conservative and, and be strongly Republican. The most powerful argument was all these t-shirts that showed up with a famous Republican, Ronald Reagan on the back, and a quote saying, uh, I can't remember the exact quote off the top of my head, but it was the same Trestles, but, also, but it was a quote from his dedication speech in 1967 or whatever, and it said, um, nobody should ever disturb this land or something like that, right? So, so very powerful rhetoric there. Um, this is a very popular surf spot, hugely important, and an incredibly important economic engine for this area. All these folks coming to surf means all these folks coming to buy uh, boards and stuff, but also hotel rooms and tacos at the taco stand and all the other knock-on effects of people drawn to this particular area to engage in this um, recreation. Um, also, things like volleyball, right? So volleyball started uh, here, beach volleyball started here, and um, it's been incredibly important to the, shaping the conceptual uh, popular image of Southern California, right? The surf culture, this beach culture. And so these are all just you know, photos from the 60s. We have these movies that come out in the 60s, these Gidget movies that are based off this real woman in Malibu um, that uh, come to symbolize this one era, these baby boomers and this and that. And, and again, has had a powerful, um, not diverse or anything like that, but, but nevertheless had a powerful shaping of how the rest of the country, and for that matter, the rest of the world, views us here. 
And now volleyball has gone totally mainstream. So, you know, obviously it's in the Olympics and this and that. Um, who won this year? Brazilians, at least for the men. Uh, uh, Brazilians won, defeated the men, the, the American men. And so this, is tr this, has, this has been true for a long time. We've had fantastic teams from around the world. But now we play beach volleyball, not just at the beach, but we play it in Buckingham Palace. We pay it, play it up in the mountains, right? We play it all these places. And you're like, wait, isn't that beach? So again, it's so powerful is this, this image and this, this uh, sense that it's being exported to non-coastal areas as well. And of course, it's played all over the world. Um, so there's that kind of story. There's also the story of the economies that um, the co all these coastal resources support. So in this case, this is um, San Pedro. This is down in Los Angeles. And this is what it looked like um, just immediately uh, in, the, in the wake of uh, World War II. Huge canning operations. Canning operations that had spun up to partly support the war effort and, and supply um, soldiers. This really started getting going in World War I, but it, it peaks, peak, um, keeps going. And here's a quote uh, from uh, this uh, booklet. It said, the new Starkist plant for, in 1954, after World War II, the canneries became mechanized factories at conveyor, table, at conveyor belt tables with spaces for more than 50 workers on either side. Cannery women were a blur of activity. So each of these things you see here is a person's head, mostly a woman. Uh, and they are uh, just canning, canning, packing, 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 you know, gutting fish, all that kind of stuff. Huge um, economic engine, the productivity of this, ocean, <clears throat> of this ocean. We'll also see when we talk about this, the radical transformation in technology that came in the wake of um, war. Uh, it's, it's, an it's an unfortunate truth that war is really a major pusher forward of technological innovation and stuff. And so in this case, it was World War II was winches. It was things like radar and sonar, and we we're getting that much better at finding these fish. And so we saw the ports boom and go and go crazy in the wake of that. Everybody wants to be at the coast. Almost every single major city on the world is either located on a river or more likely on the coast. And that's because these were the old highways. Water was the old original way to move goods and services in bulk around. So uh, we'll look at more recent data when we look at some population viewers. This data is a, is a little bit old, but um, it serves to make the point that the coast, and you guys have to understand this, the coast is different from the rest of the world. The coast is different from the rest of the world. Whatever metric you want to pick, economically, education, culture, there is something fundamentally different about the coast. And so, for example, we see that in terms of people's interest in living where we live and living at the coast. So not only to, so this is the, um, the density of people. So the bottom graph down here, so whenever I put up a graph, I should orient you guys to the graph. If I don't, yell at me, throw some paper at me or something, right? So let's take a look at this graph. So this graph is going through time. So we go from back in the day to more modern as we go to the right. And we go from uh, nobody at the bottom to very high densities at the top. This is the number of people per unit area. And what we see is the overall uh, population density of the United States on the bottom. So we are, we're obviously growing. There's more and more people all the time. Human population, that's a whole other subject to talk about. But uh, for now, we'll just say we're growing. There's more and more people. But it's a really, it truly is a story about the inner parts of the country, the interior of, the nor of North America, and the coastal zone. So we see this over and over again, which is not only do we, ha we have more people, more dense people, but the density of people is, grow is increasing at a much higher rate here in the coastal zone than inland. And so um, uh, what's it? I have some factoids here. There's, I'll be giving you guys all kinds of factoids. but. Uh, over half, 52% of the U.S. population lived in coastal watershed counties. That means a county that has a watershed that drains to the uh, ocean. So not necessarily a county exactly touching the ocean, but that drains to the ocean um, in 2010. Um, and so that's huge. So most of the U.S. are, we're mostly a coastal people. 
I grew up in San Francisco. I'm from Northern California. And uh, is anybody else from Northern California? Just one? Oh, oh two? Okay, there we go. What, what's that? that kind of, you're in Central California? I didn't, I didn't grow up there. Okay, right. But. Okay. So, so you grew up north, Andy, though? Okay. So um, when I was young and we had the drought back then, it was those bastards in Southern California. Mm -hmm. Actually, those bastards in L.A. was what people would always say. Because, you know, we reduced our toilet flushing by, you know, like 72%, but L.A. only did like by 13%, you know, or there's all that kind of stuff, right? And L.A. has horrible drivers, and it's all this kind of stuff, right? It was always Northern California versus Southern California, right? That's how it was portrayed. That's not true. It truly isn't. So this is how people would have you believe um, politics, you know, power and all that kind of stuff goes this is really how it goes the reality is that there's coastal california and the rest of california and we'll look at some of this data next time but um you pick you pick any metric you want life expectancy access to health care educational attainment median income whatever it is it's radically different and usually higher or better whatever the metric is uh on the coastal zone versus inland voting patterns track this way uh home purchases track this way all that kind of stuff so really we're a coastal versus inland people and we see that again so here's north versus south in terms of uh, back in the day to now uh, back in the day san francisco was really the regional power in terms of the distribution of people in california and that really has is no longer the case um uh and it, but it's always been, even when that was the case, it's always been coastal versus inland. And this is just showing you coastal California residents versus uh, the proportion of people that lived not in a coastal county. So some of the things that we'll explore this semester are these things we've just been talking about. But um, they, there's a whole wide range. And this is but a small smattering of things. I, I could have, instead of putting the slide up, I could have just listed today's newspaper. One of the most famous uh, singers from Mexico just died in Santa Monica, right? So coming to Santa Monica because that's where the people are, that's where the population is. South China Sea, China has been filling in, destroying coral reefs and filling them in so they can establish a military base, so they can project their military power to the Philippines and elsewhere, right? Uh, what else? Um, uh, Zika virus is now in Florida. Surprise, surprise. It's coming our way, right? It'll soon be in Texas. Uh, Louisiana and Texas probably have you know, another six months or so, but this time next year, it's going to be there, right? Um, and we go through the list of today's newspaper or headlines and find examples of almost all of this stuff. But, but for the purposes of class, we'll talk about harvesting biological resources like fish or kelp. We'll talk about disposal of, of things into the ocean. Just this weekend, Bob Ballard, uh, just a marine archaeologist, just announced they discovered um, one of the, one of the um, aircraft carriers that was used during the bikini, uh, during the uh, atmospheric testing of nuclear bombs. It was irradiated. It was dumped at the Farallon Islands just outside the mouth of San Francisco Bay. Why was it dumped there? Because it's the ocean. I just put it in the ocean, right? Who cares? It's the ocean. Um, so we, we have historically just dumped all of our crap, literally our crap, into the ocean because it's a vast, massive thing. And the old mantra still holds, which is the solution to pollution is dilution. So let's put it out. Let's, let's put the, the pollution from the smokestacks up in the air. Let's put the poop out in the water. And pretty soon it'll all be, you know, mushed away to nothing. Uh, cultivation, increasingly cultivation. Um, I, uh, we have a new sea farm starting off of San Pedro, off of Long Beach, that's specifically trying to cultivate uh, uh, food items out in the open ocean. Uh, and we, we have mariculture facilities here. One of our, our graduates uh, is now working at a culture facility in, in um, Chan Channel Islands or Oxnard, whichever, I can't remember. but. But um, right, we have cultivation things going on all over the place to try to supplement our wild caught resources from the ocean with cultivated resource, as we've done on the land. 
Um, obviously mineral energy extraction like oil and gas, things like that. We'll also talk about mineral mining in this class. Transportation and communication. How do we, when I type Pokemon Go, how does my Pokemon know where to go, right? One of the, one, if, if the, if the Pokemon, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, I don't play this game, but, <laughs> but, but if I did, and the thing lived on a server in Japan, right, it would get, we would communicate over bits flying over undersea cables. Um, national defense, it goes without saying, projecting, uh, projecting military power, et cetera, stuff like that. Um, dealing with things in a safe manner, be that for human safety or for the environmental safety or what have you. Urban development, a huge thing, a huge thing that's having a huge impact on our coastal zones. Um, how many people are living there? Not just how many people, but how are they living? How are they driving to work? Are they walking to work? Are they growing their own food locally? Are they shipping it in from overseas, what have you? And then things like tourism and recreation. These are not unimportant things. These are fundamental parts of living in this place that people, you and I, enjoy being in. And other people like to come hang out with us, and that's cool, right? And so the, the, the tourism, the recreational components are non-trivial and should not be dismissed. They are on par with these other aspects of the coastal zone. Um, for most of human history, we viewed the ocean and the things inside the ocean as immutable, as unchanging. There is always a gazillion fish. You can always throw this pollutant in there and it'll always you know, reduce down to, to be nothing. Fish were plentiful and the capacity to absorb the detrimental parts of our society unlimited, supposedly. We know that's not true. That never was true, but increasingly we know it's not true. The fact that this is a limited resource in a constrained place leads to conflicts. We can't have all these activities going on simultaneously, one layered on top of the other, without sometimes getting in the way of each other, right? So for example, we see competition for resources, right? The wave energy farm wants to farm the energy of the waves. But wait, the surfers want to surf on those waves. What? The Malibu homeowner wants to have the view to herself. The public wants to be able to view the ocean sometimes. Right? How are we going to suss out uh, who gets what? Um, and then there's also what happens when, like that first example, when not only is it you using the resource, but the very fact that you're using that is going to degrade somebody else's future potential use of that resource, right? So if we dump all our poop in the bay, because that, that's, that's good for us, now maybe there's not as many fish for the fishermen to fish in the next couple of years. Absolutely, that's the case of Rio de Janeiro. That's the story there with oil and gas pollution there and, and the collapse of the fisheries due to the um, industrial contamination and stuff of the, of the near shore areas, for example. And then we have, in, in places like our country where we actually have infrastructure and agencies that are charged with managing the coast zone because it's so diverse. We have agencies that are not used to playing with others, having to play with each other, and they get, they like to thump chests. Classically, we see that at, at our own Channel Islands Research Station. So we, ESRM, we play very well with NOAA the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the entity that manages the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, the federal waters off of the islands. We also play very well with the, Channel, with the uh, National Park, with Channel Islands National Park, which is the entity that controls the actual terrestrial side of the islands and then the fringing area just around the edge. There's a disagreement between the two agencies as to who actually controls the, you know, the just off the beach. And it depends on if we're touching, talking about something that touches the bottom or if it's up in the water column. And, um, and uh, yeah, I'll just say they, they don't always play well together. And that's two federal agencies. As soon as we start adding in shipping and fishing and stuff like that, it gets even more crazy and even more uh, conflict ridden. And not only is it, is it a conflict in terms of what their, say, legal or constitutional charge uh, to do is, it's also oftentimes 
a, conf, a, a issue of conflicting values. That not only, not so much do I legally can or can I not do that, I don't wanna ever do that, right? I wanna do X, but you wanna do Y. And so, so we have to be aware of that and acknowledge that that's a, that's a key part of coastal management is, is figuring those things out and, uh, and going forward. And not everybody talks the same language. Um, in general, this is what we're going to talk about as, in terms of threats this semester. This is sort of the mile high view of threats. This is according to Dr. A. So different people disagree as to the rank of these things. This is, this, is, um, th this is a discussion point we can start with. So first is over harvesting. That's taking out too many individuals or, or, or too great a volume from what should be a resource that's able to self replenish. So over harvesting, taking out too many whales, taking out too many fish. Number two, pollution. So uh, introducing substances that should not be there. That could be heat, that could be sound. Although we most typically think about this in terms of chemical uh, 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 different compounds getting into the water or the air of the coastal zone. And there's really two different flavors of this. One would be um, the proximate pollution, so the, the oil in the water or something like that. We could also talk about CO2 pollution, which people usually call climate change or global warming. A lot of people now consider that its whole separate category since it's, it's so big. I tend to not, I just see that as one other subcategory of pollution. Um, but you may disagree and, and, and there's lots of arguments why maybe you'd, you'd wanna do that. Uh, thirdly, we have this notion of, of habitat loss or habitat fragmentation. Um, uh, habitat is maybe not the most correct technical word, although that's what we've all come to use. Habitat is technically, strictly speaking, defined by an organism. So a snake, a particular species of snake, has a habitat. A particular species, a particular mount, you know, mountain lion have a habitat where they live and thrive. But unfortunately, habitat has gotten freed from those moorings and now is sort of oftentimes used to mean the environment. And so, but, but we're talking about the general destruction of, say, a, sea, uh, um, a seagrass bed, a dune community, something like that, or taking one big contiguous area of dunes and breaking them into smaller chunks of dunes. So either outright destruction or loss, and then uh, fragmentation or degradation. And we see that both in terms of the general just outright destruction, but also coastal development. So some of my colleagues from other universities wrote this report for the Ocean Protection Council this uh, last year about um, the importance of dealing with that, the sort of ongoing, continuous coastal development that people don't see um, as necessarily a problem always that actually may well indeed be a huge problem. Introduce species, non-native species, things that weren't there before, now are introduced, either intentionally or unintentionally, huge thing. Um, in fact, when I was uh, diving with uh, my son and, and some colleagues this summer, they were asking me to identify this one species of, of macroalgae, and I couldn't because it was a new species of sargassum that I think I know the species, but I wasn't positive. But, but um, yes, so our, our ecosystems are changing all the time. And then uh, fifth, and I think this is very important, even though it maybe doesn't rise to the, the front of some of your thinking, is institutional effectiveness. So this has to do with those last couple bullet points about agencies being able to deal with stuff, right? Having the legal and technical ability to respond, but then also the, the orientation or the philosophy or the motivation to respond in a collaborative way. It's very easy for people to say, no, I'm a fish guy. All I talk about is fish, right? I don't want to talk about surfing. I fish, you know. We, 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 there's just too much overlapping use, too many potential conflicts to behave that way. We have to act like adults, not like presidential candidates. <laughs> um, so just a couple other shots here, and then we'll get to the end of this thing. Um, 
abalone. When I was in graduate school, we, and in undergrad, a lot of times we ate abalone out on the islands for dinner. Um, even in just that short period, I'm not that old, even though I'm quite old, but I'm not quite that old. Um, but just even in the, in the, you know, 15, 20 years since I've been out of school, radically changed. Um, but the story doesn't just start a decade or two ago. We have a long history, really interesting history with a lot of our coastal resources. So for example, in the case of extracting things like abalone from the coastal zone, this started with folks that just needed to do it for subsistence. So the Chumash did it because they needed to eat. They needed, right? they, they needed to. They needed sustenance. Um, and, and the ne next wave comes in are the Russian fur traders that want to take our sea otters out, trap our sea otters. It causes a shift and starts to lead to changing abundances of lobster and things like that. Next big wave comes in is the, is the American colonization of California, spurred by the gold rush. As the gold rush comes in, all these people come in, a million people in a, in a year or so, f rush it to here. People that have no idea, what, never been to California, don't know how to eat, don't know how to shoot, don't know how to hunt, whatever. So there's a huge demand for all kinds of stuff. One of the things that, that comes with that is a need to connect our countries. So we need to start building a railroad. So we import so-called celestials or Chinese immigrant laborers. Those folks are paid crap and they have to fish to, to make a living. So, so our first modern exploiters after the Native, Amer Native Americans of abalone are um, uh, Chinese immigrants. And they start to get really good at it and they not only take squid, uh, take uh, abalone out of the water, start taking other stuff, start taking kelp, start taking squid and actually start to make their own businesses uh, out of extracting. In this case, these are some um, um, a drying racks so they can preserve, before they had refrigeration, they could preserve these, um, this essentially marine protein and they established villages. Just yesterday, or just uh, last week, it was announced one of the oldest residents of one of the, the last um, fishing villages, Chinese, Ch Chinese fishing villages in Northern California passed away. He was 90 something years old. All kinds of wonderful stories here, cultural history that, that involve the entirety of our coastline. Um, and uh, some of this is obvious, others uh, you have to dig for. And unfortunately, with rising sea levels, we're losing some of this. So a lot of these uh, cultural artifacts that um, say these fishing villages used to exist and easy to get to, with rising seas, we're seeing them get buried and washed away and stuff like that. So this is out on, the, on San Miguel. Um, then once, uh, once people start to see things like, oh, there's some money to be made in these fisheries, we start to, as we often do in our society, scapegoat the others. And so then we start this whole story of, uh, you know, these evil foreigners, you know, you might have heard something about building a wall and crap like that. Same shit, same stuff has been going on for a long time. In this case, a lot of the, the fuel for this anti-immigration uh, thing that was going on, you know, a hundred odd years ago was because these, Ch the, uh, especially the, the Chinese community had moved in and were so good at this fishery production. People were saying, man, we want their, we want their fish stocks. We want access to their fishing rights. So let's help throw f fuel on this fire, this anti-immigration -immigra racist stuff, right? So the coast zone plays into all this stuff. Um, yeah, and we can go on and on and on. And uh, long story, we'll talk more about them later. But this is, uh, uh, our, our abalone stocks are, are almost non-existent now. We've overfished them and they've been perturbed by disease, most recently withering foot disease. We've not been able to harvest abalone south of San Francisco since 1997. The fishery has been closed. Um, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so, so let's finish up with this talk of how things interplay and how things, the coastline can impact us all and have huge implications um, even beyond, for folks that don't just live at the coast. So I'll start this story, this last story, with uh, talking about um, World War I. So in World War I, uh, which was the, the so-called Great War, the first global war, the war that really gave us things like machine guns, airplanes, all these this insane uh, chemical bombs, chemical weapons, all this insanity of slaughtering human beings just because some people want to sit on a particular piece of land. 
Um, and so we send massive numbers of people, Americans send massive numbers of people over to Europe to fight in, the, in this horrible, horrible trench warfare. So guys are contained in these trenches. They can't just go up and walk around in the forest and shoot a rabbit or something, they're contained. So they start getting uh, um, um, uh, containerized food. And a lot of guys start getting sick and die because the food is, is wretched. The, the, the food is fetid. The food is not, is not safety. It's contaminated by bacteria. So that leads to some people thinking about how can we make uh, food more uh, sanitary so these guys, we get, we get compactable, we can send it somewhere without being refrigerated. People can open it up months later and it won't be poisonous to whoever needs to eat it. And so we essentially figure out how to can sardines. The short version is we put the fish, we used to sort of do stuff to the fish, then put the fish in the can. Then this approach is you put everything in the can, seal it up, and then you boil the can. Then you sterilize it. So there's no chance of, of outside bacteria, outside you know, non-clean stuff getting inside the can. So, so it's great. It's huge. It massively uh, helps American troops and allied troops, there's all this high quality protein they're getting and it really sets the stage for massive scale exploitation of these resources after the war. And so they birth a whole industry. In this case, we're talking about the Monterey Bay uh, area, births a whole industry. All kinds of canneries grow up in the wake of uh, World War I huge industry. So here you see this boat coming into dock. These boats would go out and come back maybe three times a day. And, there's, and it's just loaded with fish. I mean, a massive biological resource, incredibly productive waters here off of California. And these fish are responding to that. And these fishermen are responding to those fish in turn. This map over here on the right is a map that I've uh, modified from a um, 19... Uh, well, uh, it doesn't matter, an, an old, pub, old fishery publication. And um, what it's showing here is where the fishermen, so the fishermen have come back to, to dock and the fishing authority has asked them where were they fishing for their, um, for their fish. And all, so the dots indicate where they're fishing and, and surprise, surprise, everybody is down in the bottom of the bay near the, the canneries. Now, if you ever ask a fisherman where he fishes, he probably doesn't tell you where he fishes. But, but when you ask you know, hundreds of fishermen, even if they're mostly not exactly the truth, telling the truth, an aggregate that's probably telling us, telling us uh, there's some truth there. And what we see is a huge concentration of fishing effort, right? Very, very localized in this uh, one area. So now we have this whole industry birthed up going do, 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 do. And that attracts other things. That attracts other parts of culture that attracts artists, that, att that attracts writers, all kinds of stuff. One of the people that's most important to me, and I'd say to us, is the guy right here. His name is Ed Ricketts. Has anybody heard of Ed Ricketts before? Has anybody ever read John Steinbeck? So what what would you guys read? Grapes of Wrath or anybody ever read Cannery Row? No? Oh crap, I should have signed you guys Cannery Row. No, no. Um, so, so Cannery Row is one of Steinbeck's uh, you know, famous, uh, I don't know if it's a novel or novella, but whatever, it's one of those things. Um, but it takes place in the canneries along the shorefront of Monterey. And one of the key uh, characters in that book is a guy named Doc. So that wasn't a made up, I mean, it's a fictionalized version, but that, that was basically this real dude named Ed Ricketts. He was a crazy dude. He was most likely an alcoholic. He uh, went down to the beach because he liked the beach. And he went there because he liked to do his own thing. And the productivity of the ocean allowed him to do his own thing. He didn't know what he wanted to do. He was basically, we'd call him a scientist now, although he was kind of more fumbling around. Uh, so back in the day, he was called a natural historian. That's basically ecology without all the, the DNA sequencing, basically. Right? It's, all, it's all the fundamental part of biology. It's all, the, it's all the seasonality, the behavior, the phenology, all that, that stuff. So he was an expert in it. He just loved it so much. It's like, damn, how can I make a living? Because I like to drink. I need some money for beer or whatever he drank. Um, so he founded the Pacific Biological Laboratory, 
What did they do? They supplied samples to the rest of the country. So when a high school biology class needed a squid to dissect in Iowa, or somebody wanted a sea urchin in, in Texas, they, would, they could call up the Pacific, and they weren't near the coast, they could call Pacific Biological Lab, and they would say, hey, I need you know, 10 purple sea urchins. So he would go, okay. So he'd walk down to the tide pool, pull up purple urchins, and put them in the mail to these people. So he started his own biological collecting business, and that supported him. That also allowed him to write, which is the first most important uh, ecological study of the coastal zone, which is between Pacific Coast tides, or between, between Pacific tides. So this is a book that he wrote that first coined zonation in the inner tidal, all this wonderful stuff. He was a, an exquisite observer of the natural world. And, uh, and like I said, Steinbeck liked to drink too. And so he went and met this guy in a bar and they became fast friends. And so not only did he inspire characters in Steinbeck novels, he also did things like went around, do I have a slide of this? Uh, went around with Steinbeck and they actually decided, hey, you know what would be cool? If we went and surveyed all the biological life in Mexico, like hell yeah you know somebody with a yacht i don't know but i got like a freaking pulitzer prize so let's like buy some yacht okay so they go down they just sail down to baja and um essentially ed ricketts is picking up every crab he sees picking up every fish to, you know pictures of it drawings of it samples boom steinbeck is cataloging it i mean how cool is that a pulitzer prize winner that's writing your blog for you basically that's pretty sweet so they go and do that and he, and he so precisely recorded the location and position of all this, these samples that a couple years ago, a friend of ours repeated that exact journey and looked at, the, looked at species shifts um, over the ensuing several decades. And there was a huge number of species shifts. So, you know, tremendous value all from this being in the cool place and time with, with crazy people and in bars and workers with productivity and all this kind of cool stuff. So a whole culture builds up. Then the productivity starts to plummet. Then the fish stocks start to waver. There's definitely a component here that's over harvesting, but also we were shifting to a different oceanic regime. And so then the canneries start to go out of business. We're not bringing as much fish, not, not, as, not as cost effective. So the canneries all start to shudder. Now we're talking, uh, you know, mid 70s, late 70s. Now Monterey starts to become a super sketch place, not the kind of place you want to be at night, right? Shuttered buildings, uh, you know, sketch folks, not super safe, all this and that. What are we going to do? Another product of this area, a guy named uh, Packard goes to school invents some electronic stuff and eventually creates a company called Hewlett Packard and makes a lot of money. And he likes to invest it. And his daughter goes to school, gets a marine biology degree. So, you know, having a hard time. And so, what if we make a museum for you? Okay. So then they get the idea to let's build an aquarium, right? Where do you want to build an aquarium? I don't know. Monterey is really productive and really cool. Not a lot going on there. Cheap land. We have all these massive massive buildings that are no longer being occupied and they're coastal coast front property so hey let's go boom jump on in boom so um we now have the monterey bay aquarium one of the great aquaria in the world and it has something like almost two million people a year just to the aquarium not to monterey just to go to the aquarium so a ma another massive economic engine that's again all stemming from the productivity of this area, this coastal zone, constantly reinventing itself. And, and ultimately, the productivity and the health of a well-functioning coastal system. So, product, so productive is that coastal zone that not only do we make lots of fish, we make lots of whales as well. So one of the consequences of this productivity is uh, th these whales, in this case, this blue whale dies and washes ashore. And so, uh, in this case, this is a, a, a famous marine artist. He's going up and inspecting it, probably illegally, because that's not allowed under the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act. More on that later. Uh, uh, so, 
So uh, he's checking out, and he's, he's, a, he's uh, amongst other things, he paints whales, big oil paintings. And so he's out inspecting this whale to get a better sense of proportion, because a lot of the old drawings of whales were made by people that never saw whales swimming in nature. So a lot of the old school images, like the 1950s or older, of whales that you saw were all distended. Their bellies weren't right, their, their proportionality was all messed up, and it's because people weren't looking at whales in, in nature. So he's out here like measuring this whale so he can become a better interpreter of marine life. So he takes that and starts painting all these paintings. And one thing he does, he paints this painting of uh, two, two uh, dolphins, in this case, kissing over the earth, and um, decides uh, he's going to make this an overture for peace. So what happens is he gets drunk every January and, uh, and, and makes something up for... I'm talking about alcohol a lot. I shouldn't be talking about that. That's, that's, not, that's not a responsible thing. He has a New Year's resolution every year and to do something. And so this one year he says, oh, I'm going to have an image of world peace. What do I think of world peace? Well, I think dolphins are pretty chill and dolphins... Who hates dolphins? They're like, dolphins? Who hates dolphins? Lame people hate dolphins. Donald Trump probably hates dolphins. So, <laughs> so, so we'll have them kissing and they're kissing over the, the earth as a symbol of peace. And when dolphins uh, are attracted to one another, um, their bellies get flush, get a little pink. So we painted them with pink bellies, symbolizing these dolphins are in love when they're kissing. And so this is right around the, what will become the end of the Cold War. So this is the, the um, uh, late 80s, early 90s, right? And so you guys won't remember this, but so, so Gorbachev, who's then the, the leader of the Soviet Union, our great enemy, the evil empire, is coming on a tour of the US, a, a sort of you know, a bridge building tour. And one of the places he decides to go is to the Hoover Center. The Hoover Center at Stanford is where all these crazy conservative people hang out. It's where all the people that cr come up with the anti-Russia policies come from. And so he's gonna go to the heart of the beast. He's gonna go talk to those guys. So George Sumner, this artist, hears that and he says, oh, this is great. Uh, I'm going to go down and meet the, meet the head of the Soviet Union. Like, what the hell? He can't do that, right? So he runs out, and uh, there's all these crowds of people, and he grabs his painting, which is about eight feet tall, oil painting, and runs out on the street and, and stands it up. And he stands it up, and you know, all these people and all this secret service and everything, and Gorbachev gets out of his limousine and starts to walk into Ho the Hoover um, building, and he looks and he sees this giant oil painting of dolphins kissing. Like, what the hell is up with that, right? So he stops and he starts to walk over and all his handlers say, no, 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 you got to go in. And this thing. he's like, no, no, I go talk. Well, I don't know what he said, but he's like, I'm going to go talk to this dude. I'm like, no, 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 it's not safe. You know, whatever, Al-Qaeda. Well, it wasn't Al-Qaeda, but whatever. You're like, whatever, you know, bad <laughs> stuff is going to happen. And he goes, no, no, no. So he shuts up all his handlers and he walks over and he shakes this guy's hand and they end up having a 10-minute conversation the, the ball guy in the background is his translator, so his, he's translating from Russian to English, about the ocean and about how this ocean links us all together. And you don't see countries when you look from, the, look from space and, oh, my God, those dolphins are kissing. And then he talks about dolphins. And, you know, and so, so it's this whole conversation, right? Hard to talk about sometimes um, challenging things. People that want to put walls up between our countries and stuff like that. But if we talk about nature and stuff like this, sometimes it's easy to break through. So they have this long conversation. He finally gets pulled away because he's late to his meetings with all the power brokers and all this and that. But then Gorbachev says, hey, this is cool. And uh, long story short, the painting gets donated to this museum in Moscow. And then Gorbachev starts this foundation that's sort of like the Red Cross, but for the environment called the Green Cross. And he has this artist do the paintings for it, and then he does stuff for the UN and all this kind of stuff. The point is, all of that, a healthy coastal zone, productivity plays into all aspects of our society. It's not just something that happens in one place. It bleeds into our culture, it bleeds into our art, it bleeds into how we live. And so that's why I think um, coastal marine management is really, um, really important. And so I'll leave you with some guys playing volleyball, but that's the kind of stuff we're gonna talk about in this class. So we're going to talk about a lot of the science and all that important stuff, but ultimately we're trying to get to how do we better manage this stuff. And ultimately management is about people. So we're going to learn about the ge geomorphology, we're going to learn about the fish, we're going to learn about the whatever Zika viruses floating around, but ultimately 
we're talking about how we humans choose to use resources in this class. Sound good? All right, let's do it. So there we go. I'll see you guys on Wednesday.